You know, you could not get through that hymn we sung earlier if you can't count. <laughs> so now that we have our mathematical brains in gear, <clears throat> let's talk about a, um, an enigmatic subject. Now, I don't want to talk about whether the earth is flat or not. That's not my purpose. We're going to hit on it a little bit. But this is more following Friday night's discussion, how do you know what you know? And how can you know what can be known? This is um, something I prepared specifically for you, with you in mind. I've never... Oh, come on now. <clears throat> okay, I'll give the talk room back here. That's fine. But I don't dare step up here because I know what's going to happen. All right, that's a little better. I still hear the ring. All right, we're going to risk it. I've never given this talk before. I haven't practiced it. I've worked on it for hours and hours and hours and hours, but I don't know how long it's going to take, and I only have a certain amount of time, so I just might have to stop in the middle. We're going to see. But this is a fun topic of exploration. But I'm going to start off with a question, though. What if the Bible is agnostic about the shape of the earth? What is the purpose of Scripture? Is it to tell us everything about science? What if the purpose of Scripture is to point us to Jesus Christ? The Bible is not supposed to be wrong about anything in science or history, but what if it just doesn't say it either way? Because the Bible is a story of the God of the universe searching for a bride for His Son. That's us the Christians. That's nothing to do with the shape of the earth or even the age of the earth. The age of the earth is an incidental thing we can tease out of Scripture, and we can get a very good estimate for the age of the entire universe from the Bible. But the purpose of the Bible is not to tell us a minute-by-minute -minute account of world history. So what if the purpose of the Bible is not to tell us if the earth is round, flat, square, or trapezoidal? What you're seeing here is not an artist rendition. This actually is a photograph, a series of photographs taken by a satellite that we have put into a Lagrange point. A Lagrange point is a, um, a place in space where the gravitational forces between two objects are balanced, so you can put something there and it'll stay in put. It'll stay put. Now, there are like, you know, Jupiter and the moon, and, and so gravity's not perfect, so you have to use little jets to hold the thing in place, but it'll basically it'll stay there. And they put a satellite between the earth and the sun, and it just sits there. And every hour, it takes a picture of the earth and beams it back to, back to us here. And it got photobombed by the moon. That's not cut and paste. That's a picture of the earth, a picture of the earth, oh, and the moon. Boom, boom, boom. Now, is that a gigantic uh, lie, or is that real? That's some of the questions we're going to deal with this morning. However, I want to bring up a, a verse that troubles me greatly. This actually, I'm, I'm afraid of this verse. Anyone who ever gets up in front of an audience should have this in their mind. It's James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Ouch. If I make a mistake, it's on me. If I tell you something on authority that I think is true, but I'm just kind of guessing and it's not true, that's on me. If I deliberately lie, that's definitely on me. And if I'm going to say something where I'm going to reject 2,000 years of Christian history and scholarship, then I better know what I'm talking about because that is at my peril. I mean, how many times does someone come up with some new doctrine? Uh, never. Lots of people have come up with new heresies, sure. But to come up with a thought that Christians haven't thought of in 2,000 years, the probability of you actually not speaking heresy is approaching zero. So we got to be very careful with certain ideas. I want, to point to, I want to point you to something very, very interesting. If you have not read this, I want to highly encourage you to read it, and specifically a modern version where they've updated the letters, because in King James English, the U's and V's were switched and the S's and F's look very different, and you have to get used to reading it. It's fun to read it that way, but it takes a couple of minutes to say, okay, that's a that, and this is this, and then suddenly you can read it. 
But there is an introduction to that first edition King James called The Translators to the Reader. This is Miles Coverdell and uh, the other guy, the two people in charge of the big project. And they, they divvied out different aspects of Scripture to different translation teams. And you can see in the King James where one translation team stops and another starts. Because different, they construct their sentences differently. They use different vocabulary. It's really cool. But these two guys, their task was to take the whole Bible and read through it and stylize it to make it look like it was one work. And they wrote some amazing things. They're writing about their methodology, how they approach Scripture, how they dealt with controversial passages or passages that they weren't quite certain about. And in this passage, they specifically said, there's a number of animals and minerals. We don't know what they are. They're used one time in the Bible, and they're not used anywhere else in any Hebrew writing that they had. They know from context it's an animal or a mineral, but they don't know which one it is. Oh, that's interesting. And this section here, they're, they're actually talking about whether or not they should have footnotes in the Bible. And they write this. It hath pleased God in his divine providence here and there to scatter words and sentences of the difficulty and doubtfulness, not in doctrinal points that concern salvation, for in such it has been vouched that the Scriptures are plain, but in matters of less moment, that fearfulness would better beseem us than confidence. I love that. The humility of two of the greatest scholars in Christian history who gave us a phenomenal translation like one never seen before. And yet they're saying they don't know everything and they're approaching some things with a great deal of caution. So let us please approach the shape of the earth with a great deal of caution. Okay? Now, to explain what we're dealing with here. Today, we're going to have a lunar eclipse. No, sorry, we're going to have a solar eclipse. That is when the moon gets between the earth and the sun. A lunar eclipse is when the earth gets between the moon and the sun. What we don't want is an apocalypse. <laughs> I was talking to someone today outside. He says, brother-in-law has fallen to flat earth thing. Um, there's a, someone said, my, my boss uh, believes in flat earth. Someone said, my pastor believes in flat earth. I know lots of people who, who believe that. I'm not antagonistic. I'm going to strongly say they're wrong, but I'm not antagonistic. Okay? There's a difference there. But in talking with people, um, there's a testimony we found. This, this man, he says, I wasn't flat earthers. Sorry about the grammar. I wasn't flat earthers four months ago. I was like refuting them, calling them stupid. I wasn't praying for God's truth. I accidentally stumbled upon solid information. I felt like my prayers led me there. I prayed against flat earth like it was a disease, like how you see it. One day I was praying, I heard God speak to my spirit. Do you mock my creation? I said, no, Father, forgive me. Since then, I've been growing from there. We think we know the world through science, but, I, we, but we don't until we embrace it through God. Can you see errors in this? One, he's claiming direct revelation from God. If you are a prophet, do you realize the, um, the Old Testament law about false prophets? Two, you're claiming revelation. Is, does that revelation contradict 2,000 years of Christian scholarship? Then you had better really be learning from God. How do you know it's God and not something else? And how do I know, if you're telling me this, how do I know that you actually heard from God? What's my test? The burning in your bosom? Well, that's, your, that's Mormonism. How, so, we have built over 1,000, 2,000 years methods for testing the spirits. And one method is, does that gel with rational thought? Another is, does that fit the Bible? This is hard. This person has rejected too much. This is why the other night I brought up what I call the two worlds fallacy. When you have two different ideas that are competing with each other, well, both of those ideas are actually competing over the same territory. So if you want to answer the questions, you can't, answer, you can't argue about what they both explain. Natural selection, change over time, 
genetic similarity between chimpanzees and, common, and, and humans. So what? That's all creationists can explain that too. Evolution say that's proof of evolution. We say, no, it's not. You have to get outside the overlap to areas like the origin of life, the origin of complexity, things the evolutionists can't answer. That's where the argument is. The problem is um, flat earth theory is not even here. It's out here somewhere because there's zero supporting evidence for it. It's not a rational discussion. Just laying it out there. I also talked about operational science versus historical science, and that person has rejected operational science. The things you can know. That machine I set out there on purpose. Thank you whoever was taking a couple measurements for me while I was eating breakfast. I don't know who you were. Thank you. There was going to be a hole. There's actually going to be an hour-long hole in our measurements. Why are we doing this again? Because we're going to get different numbers today than we did on Saturday. Because the sun has changed elevation in the sky over two days. And I think we're going to be able to measure that. I hope. But operational science is things you can know. Things you can test today. Things that when you run an experiment, you keep on getting the same answer. Look, gravity. 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 I hope I don't drop my phone. Gravity. It's always the same. It's never been violated. We've never, except when Jesus arose to heaven, we've never seen a, a violation of the law of gravity. Likewise, measuring stellar observations, flying an airplane around the world, and thousands, if not millions, of scientific experiments document how, what the shape of the earth is. So we, ha- we can't reject operational science. To do so puts you in ludicrous zone. Okay? We've got to be real careful about that. But we can reject historical science. We can have robust arguments on things that happened in history that no one was a witness to. So for, the, for me, for the Bible-believing scientist who's a creationist, I'm not rejecting facts about science. I'm rejecting historical interpretations of scientific things that happened in the past. That's where we split the line between where we can hold science or reject science, okay? But what if you could have science and the Bible? What can you, what if, sorry, I'm not going to read this. Where is that place where you can have science and the Bible? What can you know is true? What can you safely assume is true? And what can you say, no one can ever know that? Where do you draw the line? Now, interestingly, in laying all this stuff out, I've been thinking about this for years, not realizing I'm following the pathway of Thomas Aquinas. Who's that? Probably the most important Catholic in your viewpoints of your theology. Thomas Aquinas, who applied logic, he brought the works of Aristotle into theology, and he had a profound influence on science and theology. Before that, most people were platonic. And Plato, using his life, people didn't trust their own senses. The spiritual world was pure and complete and undefiled. But here, this is all muddy, you don't really know, and it was, it was very mystical. We don't live in that world happily. We live in a very astaltitarian world where we have things we can touch and trust. We can't avoid philosophy in our theology or in our science, and it has a weird effect on us today. But look at what Aquinas says. Now, this is 13th century. The man lived in the 1200s. He wrote this. The physicist proves the earth to be round by one means, the astronomer by another, for the latter proves this by means of mathematics, e.g. by the shape of the eclipses, ooh, or something of that sort. That's the shape of the lunar eclipse, because the, moon sh- the Earth's shadow on the moon is always round, no matter where that is on the moon. But for the former proves it by means of physics, e.g. by the movement of the heavenly bodies toward the center, gravity, before gravity was even invented, and so forth. Now, wait a second. He's saying that all these other disciplines of science show that the earth is round in the 1200s. How many of you have heard that Columbus was arguing that the earth is round and the church was teaching the earth is flat? Who? Show your hands. Who has not heard that? Wow. 
then you've never watched Bugs Bunny. <laughs> and it, it, it's all over the place. That actually is a complete and total lie. It was invented by America's first great novelist, Washington Irving. He wrote um, The Man from Sleepy Hollow. Um, he all, whatever, whatever from Sleepy Hollow. He also wrote a, a, a famous, famous book on Columbus. It was, it was literally, it was like America's first novel. And everyone in America wrote it, read it. And in that novel, he has a big argument between Columbus and the church leadership. And the Christians were saying, the earth is flat. And Columbus was saying, no, the earth is round. Washington Irving hated Christianity. He was mocking Christianity in that book. The church was saying that Columbus was wrong because they were saying, um, Christopher, the earth is twice as big as you think. And they were right. Columbus had a manuscript written in a foreign language with different units. It's, a, it's like the difference between miles and kilometers. A kilometer is six-tenths of a mile. His world was 60% the size of the real world. And church was saying, we're right, you're wrong, you're going to die. You're not going to make it to China. They were correct. He could never have sailed to China on that little ship across that ocean. That they would have died before they got there. But because he thought the earth was smaller... When he got to the new world, he thought he was in China. The earth is always taught, I'm sorry, the church, church if I could, lowercase c, capital C, Catholic or otherwise, has always taught that the earth is round. Oh, but doesn't the Bible say the earth is flat? Where do you go to for a flat earth statement in the Bible? Well, we had the conversation earlier, the four angels on the four corners of the world holding back the winds in Revelation. And my comment was, so are you going to think that Revelation is literal now? Well, what eschatological viewpoint do you have? Literal Revelation? Whoa, hey. You think a star is going to fall into the, into the sea? You know how big stars are? In our article, Flat Earth and Other Nonsense, debunking ideas that would not exist were not for the internet. This is a very, very long article, but there's a table of contents there. If you're interested, you can ask yourself a question. Oh, this person said that. It's in the table of contents. Click on it. But what we document here is the founders of the modern flat earth movement. It's scary because it doesn't come from Christianity. The two big movers, the guys who became the most famous early on, they're all over YouTube, got millions and millions of views, were... Yeah, that's right. Sorry. There's a cursor in my picture. Eric Dubai. He's a yoga instructor and a pot smoker living in Thailand. And his videos were famous, and he was telling the earth is flat. And then Eric Skiba, who is a non-Trinitarian heretic, who's also an anti-Semite. He basically is a closet neo-Nazi. Those are the two guys who gave us the modern flat earth movement beyond anybody else. And then Michael Heiser, the uh, uh, theologian who says that the, the Bible says the earth is flat and the Bible's wrong. And meanwhile, I just pointed out that even in the 1200s, the, everyone knew the earth was round. There's no theologian in Christian history except two vague examples that I've heard about and they were like burned at the stake or something. I'm not even sure what they believe because it's hard to know what had heretic actually believed. It's what the report of the heretic believed. You don't know what the, how accurate the report is, right? But maybe two vague figures in all of Christian history taught the earth was flat. So did the church ever teach it? The answer is no. Here's another one. Boethius. He wrote a book called The Consolation of Philosophy. He lived 480 to 525 AD. That was the most widely read and influential books throughout the West for the entire Middle Ages. Every single priest, every scholar, most of the royal people, anyone who could read would have read Boethius. And he wrote this. As you have heard from the demonstrations of the astronomers, in comparison to the vastness of the heavens, it is agreed that the whole extent of the earth has a value of a mere point. That is to say, were the earth to be compared to the vastness of the heavenly sphere, it would be judged to have no volume at all. So 
throughout the entire Middle Ages, we understood that the heavens are vast. That is not what I thought. I thought there was a crystal sphere over the earth and the, the stars were embedded in it. And it's not really that far away. If you travel far enough, you can knock on the edge of the, or stick your head through the, the, through the sphere. You, no. Church has never taught that. The crystal sphere idea is Greek. That's Ptolemy, not Scripture. Or how about the venerable Bede? It's one of my favorite of all the, all the, uh, the old scholars. He, um, he's an Anglo-Saxon monk. He lived um, in the 700s. He writes, We call the earth a globe because if all things are included in the outline, the earth's circumference will represent the figure of a perfect globe. Not circular like a shield, but rather like a ball. And it extends from a center with perfect roundness on all sides. Oh, I could walk away right now. Yet, the earth isn't a perfect sphere. It's wider at the middle than it is top to bottom. Why? Because it's spinning. The equator is further from the center than the north and south pole are. Because that centripetal force makes it bulge out a little bit. But if you took a ping pong ball and blew it up to the size of the earth, it would be less round than the earth is round. That bulge is almost nothing compared to the diameter. And even mountains and things like that, the ping pong ball will be more rough than the earth is. So his statement that it's a perfect roundness on all sides is to within many degrees of freedom correct. And for the measurements of the time that they're able to do, it was correct. Hey, um, have you ever seen pictures like this? You ever seen a picture like that? What's King James I of England holding in his hand? A globe with the cross on top, signifying Christ is the king of the earth. And it's been in our face all this time, and most people don't know it. Here's Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa. Now, cardinals are people who can get elevated to the pope, right? He's like second in rank in all the Catholic church. In fact, Nicholas is a very, very important person, very famous, lived in the 15th century. It has already become evident to us, the earth is indeed moved. In other words, he didn't believe in geocentrism. Even though we do not perceive this to be the case, we are apprehend motion only through a certain comparison with something fixed. For example, if someone did not know that a body of water was flowing, it did not see the shore while he was on a ship in the middle of the water, how would he recognize the ship was being moved? So if you got in a car and blacked out the windows, and you, you, you might feel this, but you wouldn't know if you were moving or not. You had no idea how fast you're moving unless you could listen to the rev of the engine. This is relative motion. He is setting the stage for Einstein 600 years ago. Ah, I love this stuff. In fact, uh, the Bible actually has something to say about this too. When the 14th night had come as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. The literal Greek translation is, Land, they, they noticed land to be drawing nearer to them. It's a nautical-centric reference. They're in a ship. Hey, land is moving toward us. That's what the Greek says. We don't translate it that way. Because we translate it that way, everyone would stop and wait and say, what? <laughs> Relative motion is really cool. Now, I want to talk about three different types of experiments. This is critically important in the world of science. We all want to, de to develop the first type of experiment, and no one wants the third type. They're called type 1, 2, or 3, sometimes A, B, or C, but I like type 1, 2, and 3. Type 1 experiments can actually discriminate between two hypotheses. Is the earth flat or is the earth round? It might just say if it's a type 2 experiment, okay, we know the earth's not flat, but we don't know if it's round or not. Or we know the earth moves, we don't know how fast it moves. That's a type 2. You, you can say one thing, but it's not necessarily not true about the other. Natural selection. Yeah, it supports evolution, but it doesn't contradict creation. It's ambivalent. It's in the middle. Who cares? A type 3 experiment? Oh, no, no. You set up a type 3 experiment, and your results are meaningless because your experiment was invalid. And sadly, I've done several of those in my life. And I'm looking at this, I worked really hard to get this stuff, and I'm looking, 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 saying, oh, man, that, um, just, 
Go back to square one, set up the experiment correctly so it actually has a real test. Can you see type one, two, and three? Okay, type one, you can discriminate between two ideas. Type two, you can support one idea, but it says nothing about the other idea. And type three is not science. Let me ask you a question. Who gave you the ability to think? God did. Who put in us a desire to explore the world? Who created that world? Can Satan deceive people into thinking a completely untrue thing about an obvious reality? Can he deceive millions of people about simple math? (laughs) Not unless they're truly deceived. But if you just put something simple in front of somebody, you have to acknowledge the truth of one plus one equals two. You have to. If you can't acknowledge that, you have no place in modern society. We're not having a conversation. We're going to, you know, I'm going to refer you to a psychologist or a preacher, but we're not going to have a discussion on whatever you want to talk about because you're not actually operating in the sphere of adults. I highly recommend you dig into some of these topics on creation.com. That how to think, not what to think article that I wrote, that's where I introduced the two spheres uh, ar- um, argument. You, have you heard of Michael Behe? He's an intelligent design philosopher. He came up with um, irreducible complexities. Very, very, well, he was at a conference where I first presented that, and he came up and asked me a question in front of the whole audience. And as he's walking away, he goes, I can't get that two circles illustration out of my head. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Another article, why the universe does not revolve around the earth scriptural and scientific reasons. Another one, refuting absolute geocentrism. That's one I just showed you a minute ago. Another one, flat earth and other nonsense. Another one, a direct test of the flat earth. Besides that thing, there's another test. I mentioned the other night. I'm going to show you some results later on. Another one, total eclipse of the brain. I wrote that seven years ago. Um, another one I highly recommend. This is a fun uh, article series, Dystopian Science, Parts 1 through 3. My co-author and I said, okay, what if, like, the world gets nuked and only a few people survive? How do we rebuild society? Oh, that was a fun. It just what would happen first? What would happen second? How much Bible do we need? How would the Bible guide us to rebuilding everything we need to have a society again? That was a, a, fun, a fun article series. But I also came up with this a couple of years ago. I call it Carter's Theorem of Information Contamination. And I say that for every po- true postulate that exists, there will eventually be at least one YouTube video claiming it is not true. And I have this lovely curve here. This is the proportion of true postulates claimed to be false over time. So we have the ancient past, then we have the invention of the internet, then we have today, and then we have woe unto us. <laughs> In the mathematical terms, I said the limit as time approaches infinity of the probability of a false claim over time equals one. So that's for your, your, your math nerds. Here's the issue we have in our modern society. There is no price of entry. In the past, if you wanted to address an audience, you had to have a degree or be a, a person of worth, or you'd have, you'd have no, they didn't let any Joe just stand up and start talking. That's not true today. Every person who's supposed to be on medication is not, is on the internet. And so we see things like this. Have you ever seen something like this? Hey, if pilots black out at nine Gs and the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, that's true, by the way. The circumference of the earth is 24,000 miles in circumference. It turns once in 24 hours. That's 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, zero miles an hour at the poles. That, by the way, results in a Coriolis effect. Because you have that spin here and no spin there, anything that's going from point A to point B on the globe, it keeps the old spin and therefore it looks like it's curving, but it's really traveling in a straight line according to the old reference frame, etc. But 
if the earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour and traveling through space at 67,000 miles an hour, how come we don't black out? Pilots black out at 90s. How come we don't black out? Or, or the, the illustration of the kid on the merry-go-round, the kid holding on for dear life. Ooh. Why does that child not, f- he's flying away on the merry-go-round at a slow speed. Well, how come we don't fly off the earth if we're spinning at 1,000 miles an hour? If the child on the merry-go-round flies off at a slow speed, how come we don't fly off the earth if we're spinning at 1,000 miles an hour? Gravity is that strong? A thousand miles an hour? If I'm driving in the car at a thousand miles an hour and I take a right turn, what's going to happen? I'm going to fly right through the window. I'm going to go in a straight line. I'm going to die. Come on now. How do we not fly off the earth? Are, are, are you hesitant to answer because you don't know how to answer it? I heard gravity. Gravity actually is the answer. Well, the answer is you need a little bit of math. In fact, you need the formula F equals MR times 2 pi over big T squared. And we're like, oh, I'm done. Goodbye. <laughs> In simple, simple terms is this. The spinning of the earth, because of that great radius, it only creates about 3.39 newtons of outward force. That is, if you were a 100 kilogram or 220 pound person, you would weigh 12 ounces less on the equator you wouldn't even notice it. It travels slowly. To produce that force in the merry-go-round, it'd have to turn once every 59.1 seconds. That'd be the most boring merry-go-round in the world. It would, it would go around as fast as a second hand on a clock. That's how much force you're talking about. But these kind of things are things that like physics students sitting over lunch would joke about. Hey, if that kid flies off the merry-go-round, how come we don't fly off the earth? Ha, ha, ha. Well, everyone knew the answer instantly, but it's just a joke and it's kind of funny. And yet people have picked up things like that and they throw it at us and we don't know how to answer it. That took me hours to answer that. Hours. And I used to teach physics. I'm like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. I didn't even remember the formula. I had to look up the formula. Because who remembers stuff like that? But that is a powerful, deceitful meme that is a lie and it's false. Beware. Have you ever seen the flat earth map? The map that has the North Pole and everything spread out and Antarctica is an ice wall around the perimeter. Have you seen this map? There are people who think that is the shape of the earth, but you know what? Uh, I drew that map. I'm a computer programmer. I got on Python. I learned how to draw a polar azimuthal ex- equidistant projection. That is a, just a map project. You've seen the Mercator map where Greenland's like this big. All maps are, have a problem in that we take a globe and we try to project it onto a flat piece of paper. It doesn't matter how you do it, it will be distorted. This is a map of maximum distortion at the edges. North-south, if you're traveling toward the North Pole, nothing's distorted. East-west, around the perimeter, everything is distorted. But because I can do this, um, I can do this anywhere on the earth. Here's a flat earth map based on Los Angeles. Here's a flat earth map based on Antarctica, where North America and Asia are the ice wall and Antarctica are sitting there in the middle. It's just a projection. It's not reality. Just because the UN uses this as their map doesn't mean the UN secretly believes the earth is flat. They just wanted a glow, or a map, sorry, a map where all the countries on earth could be shown on one map. And the only way to do it is to squish it. So here's the UN version. As a, my article, a direct test of the flat earth model. Flight times. What I did is I went down to the local library with my son and I had him put his finger on Johannesburg and we stretched a string to all these major world cities. Cities where I knew you could catch a flight from Johannesburg to without any stopovers. You can fly to all those places from South Africa. And then I got online and I calculated the great circle distance. I could have used latitude and longitude, but I used an online calculator, same thing. Great circle distances on a globe from Johannesburg to all these other places. And then I drew them on a flat earth map 
and I measured in millimeters the distance. So I have three things. I have how long it takes to fly, how many millimeters it is, and how many miles it is using a great circle route. And I, you can make them all comparable to one another. And I have things like this, like there are people who say you cannot fly from Johannesburg to Sydney. Because think about it, on the flat earth map, a plane can't fly that far. Plus it has to fly across the Himalayas. If you took that route, you would see yourself flying across the Himalayas. But planes can't fly that far. That's like 40,000 miles. So instead, the route is a straight line from here to here, but on, on a flat, it looks like it curves like this. You actually get close to Antarctica. Uh, we have an office in Australia. CMI has an office in Brisbane, which is right next to Sydney. Every single one of our speakers, about 10 of them there, have made the flight from Australia to South Africa. And yet there are people who say, you can't even book that ticket. It doesn't exist. It's not true. It's there. But if we take this information, here I have the great circle distance and how long it takes to fly. Look at that. The further you're going on the globe, the longer it takes to fly. Okay, that's great. This is the, let's say, the flight time. Oh, what was that last one? I think I messed it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Um, excuse me. This is how far it is on the globe and how far it is when I measured it with the string. I was shocked that my string technique was accurate. I couldn't believe it. This is how long it takes to fly and how far it is. There's a little bit of variation in there because, you know, there are different flight uh, approaches to different airports. And you can't just fly to Amsterdam. You have to get in the train of all the planes flying into Amsterdam. And that takes a little while. So it's not perfect, but there's a direct proportion. The f longer it is, the, or the farther it is, the f longer it takes to get there. Duh. <laughs> but then when I graph these points on the flat earth on this, how long it takes and how far it is, um, Here's my original points. They're nice on the line, a little bit off. But the open triangles, the open diamonds, they're all over the place. They kind of follow a line of regression, but why are some up here and some down there? Well, the answer is, if, if you're flying due north, you don't get any distortion. But the distance of these points from that line is proportional to how far east and west they are. The worst ones are the ones that fly to South America or um, Madagascar, and the best ones are the ones that fly to Europe. Why? Because when you take a globe and squish it, all the distortion is on the edges. And if you're trying to fly to the edges, it's more distorted. Okay? Or how about this? The sun is a globe. We can see things go around the sun and appear on the other end. The sunspots will go around and they'll reappear. It's clearly a spinning globe. In fact, the center spins at a different rate than the poles. Okay? We know that. But if the earth is actually flat, how does that round sun produce that in the fall and the spring when exactly half of the earth is lit up? And on a spinning globe, we say, here's the axis of the earth, here's the sun, and exactly half of the globe is lit up. But in a flat earth map, it has to do that. A round sun has to do that. That's weird. Even worse, though, in the June solstice, that's what's lit up. And in the winter solstice, that's what's lit up. It's like that, again, because of the distortion. It's not true. It's always exactly half of the earth is lit up. Because when you squish the earth, you get these weird patterns. All right, enough of that. Enough of that. How large is the earth? How do we know? I tell you what, you as a person, you're too small. You cannot know how big the earth is. You have to travel a lot. You have to take a lot of measurements everywhere you go, or you have to trust other people to take measurements for you. But we've known not only that the earth is a globe, we've known how large the earth is from 200 B.C. till today. There was a man named Eratosthenes. 
He was the uh, head librarian of the Great Library of Alexandria. That's one of the seven wonders of the ancient worlds, the Library of Alexandria. Now, I've been to Alexandria. I wasn't there on, a, on the equinox, though, or the solstice. If I was, I would have been measuring angles of shadows. Oh, man, that would have been cool. But I've also been to his hometown, Syene or Aswan, the famous Aswan Dam, the temple of Ramses II that they moved up the hill when they filled up Lake Nasser. I mean, it's amazing things in Egypt. Well, he knew from his boyhood experience that on one day of the year, the sun hit the bottom of a well in Aswan, which means the sun is straight up. Because Aswan is very close to the Tropic of Cancer. That's that ring around the world where in June, the sun is straight up. So wherever you are on that ring, goes through Cuba, south of us. It goes through Aswan, Egypt. Wherever you are in that ring, the sun will go right from the horizon, straight overhead, and straight down. It's a perfect right angle across the sky. It never does that here because we're north of that. But he knew that. On that day of the year, the sun is straight overhead. But he was in, in Alexandria to the north. Because the, the Egyptians surveyed their country every seven years, he knew how far away these two places were. Oh. And he measured the shadow in Alexandria on that day, and it was seven degrees, not zero. He said, I am seven degrees away from that well. Seven degrees was, I don't remember how many, it was measured in stadia, whatever the number was. Like, I don't remember what the number was, but whatever the number was, times 360 divided by seven equals the circumference of the earth. He was 72 miles off. Columbus was wrong. The Catholic scholars of the day were correct. And we've known that for over 2,000 years. And yet, if you take that same exact setup, where you have 800 kilometers between Alexandria and Syene, you know that the, the sun is directly overhead, so you have a right angle here. Remember your trigonometry? Angle, side, angle, you get 300 miles if the earth is flat. And that's why the flat earth proponents say that the earth is 300 miles, that the sun is 300 miles overhead, and it circles the earth. But if it circles the earth, you know what it would never do? It would never do this. I took those photographs of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, on a beautiful, beautiful cloud-free morning. The sun hits the horizon. It can't do that if it's circling overhead. So they invent something. Oh, well, the laws of optics. No, you, what are you talking about the laws of optics? Do you know what the law, do you know what Snell's law of diffraction is? Refraction, whatever it is. I mean, they'll invent things that are pseudo-scientific, but they have no explanatory power. The sun should not touch the horizon, and yet it does. In fact, here, this is what it does. The sun does that. Now, that line called the ecliptic, it changes through the seasons. In the wintertime, it has a lower angle. In the summertime, it has a higher angle. But it doesn't change by very much, but that's what it does here. The stars follow that pattern. The, the, the moon all the planets and the sun follow the same path. And yet, you remember that machine out there? From north, it could measure the azimuth and the elevation. Well, if the, if the moon is 300 miles up and it goes through the sky like this, you could measure the azimuth and the elevation of the moon. In fact, you could predict it. And when you do that, you get something like this. This, this red line, that is my estimate of where the sun should be on the flat earth model. How far above the horizon? Look, it never hits the horizon. It never hits zero. What we did the other day during daylight was this. So in the middle, this flat earth model and the real model are very similar. But the further off you go this way, this gray line is the difference. When you get into the early morning and the late afternoon, that's when you can tell them apart. And that's why we did those measurements. That's why we're doing it again. That's why, for those of you who weren't here, we spent all day measuring those things. And then I got on the NOAA's website, and I entered our latitude and longitude, and I calculated, the, the, in blue here, the elevation of the sun, and in red, the angle from north of the sun throughout the day, what it's supposed to be. And then we ran our numbers, which is a lovely little data table there. We came up with that, following NOAA's measurements. Now, 
seven years ago when I did this. I, it wasn't quite as accurate. It's a little bit off. But the blue is a global earth, and those are my measurements. Red is the expectations from a flat earth. And the azimuth and the elevation followed this global idea. You okay? And I'm trying not to beat a, bit, beat a dead horse, and I know I've already gone for a long time, and i got so much more I want to tell you. I'm talking about the apparent size of the sun. Da, 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 da. Okay, why does, the, why does the Bible talk about sunrise and sunset? From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. You know that song? Why does the Bible talk about sunrise and sunset? Does that mean we're stable? Does, that, does the sun go around us, or do we go around the sun? Well, the answer is, we don't have a better way of saying this in English. You don't say, oh, look at that. My tangential view of the earth's horizon has such a position that the sun has come into my ocular vision field. <laughs> no, you say, hey, look at that. It's called sunrise. This is called phenomenological language. We all use it every day. It's what makes conversation possible. The fact that there's phenomenological language in the Bible is not surprising, and it does not mean that the earth is the center of the universe. Another example. Self-taught rocket scientist plans to launch over ghost town. This is Mad Mike Hughes. He actually died doing this. But before that, I'm not laughing at him. Sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be a joke. He writes, he said this. He says, I don't believe in science, says Hughes, whose main sponsor for the rocket is Research Flat Earth. I know about aerodynamics and fluid dynamics and how things move through the air, about the certain size of rocket nozzles and thrusts. But that's not science. That's just a formula. There's no difference between science and science fiction. What, okay, what, what's his mistake? What did he fail to distinguish properly? Operational science and historical science. Everything, this rocket nozzle stuff, that's all operational science. What he's saying is he doesn't believe in evolution. He doesn't believe in the philosophy, the historical things, but he, he, he drew the line in the wrong place. What we're seeing in our world is an existential crisis in philosophy. We're seeing a failure of critical thinking, a failure of subjective, uh, application of subjective reasoning, a lot of arbitrary conclusions, tons of conspiracy theory, and I'm sorry, but a rejection of biblical principles. The Bible tells us to think clearly. We have a brain given by God. We can put two and two together. And I tell you what, that's a photograph of Earth from the other side of Saturn. And if the Earth is at the center of the universe, you can't use gravity to explain the motions of the objects in the solar system. You can define them. You can use formulas to explain the passage of the planets, but there's no physical mechanism behind it. In fact, um, if things go around the Earth, then in order to get Neptune around a circle and back to where it started again, it would have to move faster than light speed, etc. Oh, man, there's so much more. I'm skipping over so much. Oh, I want to talk about... Copernicus and Galileo and Einstein and all those people. Okay, but in the end, so what? If the earth is flat, it could still be millions of years old. If the earth is flat, evolution could still be true. If the earth is flat, it doesn't mean there aren't round places out there with aliens. It doesn't preclude other religious concepts either. It does nothing for us. It only makes us ridiculous because we can't say that one plus one equals two. It's too much, it's too far, and Christianity for 2,000 years has not believed it. Psalm 96.10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge peoples with equity. Doesn't that mean that the earth doesn't move? How about Psalm 121? I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes, uh, does my help come. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. Same word, same principle. He who keeps, you will not slumber. So where does the flat earth ideas come from? Cult-like brainwashing. 
They have all the evidences of it. Just the, unlike most cults, there's no financial control, there's no sexual control, and there's not one single leader. But you go down that rabbit hole, it's hard to come back. Once you start questioning reality, it's hard to stop questioning reality. And there's so much misinformation, there's so much lying around, but it makes you feel special. It makes you feel like you know something other people don't know. It makes you feel like God's been talking to you. And I want to, uh, especially young people, be careful about exploring such things. Be very careful. You might start as a joke like that guy did earlier and then get trapped. And once you're trapped, I haven't seen people come out of it. So leave with uh, Matthew chapter 10. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and an innocent as doves. Be careful, my friends. And Matthew 18, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin or stumble, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened about his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Um, there is a, just like the first verse I read earlier, when we're talking to people about our faith, we had better know what we're talking about. We better be very careful. There's a lot more in this. Uh, spacecraft Earth, where I don't have it with me, but we sell it on our website. Henry Richter designed the first thing ever to land on the moon and not smash. He also designed things that we sent to Venus. He's a Christian. He's a young Earth creationist. He's an amazing person. Spacecraft Earth is a really cool book. Or Spike Saris's three-part series on astronomy. Or our movie, Alien Intrusion, or the book, Starlight Time and the New Physics, or Light Years No Problem. We've done a lot of things on physics of space. Evolution's Achilles heels, too. I'm going to leave you with her. I'm, I'm hurrying up because I do want to do some questions. First Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. You know what? My hope isn't in the shape of the earth. My hope is in the works of Jesus Christ. And if I'm spending my life talking about flat earth and trying to keep, convince people that the earth is flat, I'm actually squandering opportunities to tell them about heaven. So let's not waste our time on it. Now, finally, parents, uh, I want to caution you about something. I don't necessarily agree with this um, opt ophthalmologist, but this is Dr. Patricia Fink. She says, one, solar retinopathy is permanent. It's possible if you view incorrectly. It's not fixable. It can happen quickly without having immediate symptoms for real. Th her third point, your retina does not have pain receptors, so this won't hurt like a sunburn. Parents, watch your children like hawks, please. Last eclipse, I'm stupid, but I'm a nerd. I'm like, I gotta know. So I went, oh. And I looked at the, the thing, and it was really bright, and I put my sunglasses right back on. I didn't want to burn my retinas out, but I just had to, don't, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth, there's a, a report of a woman, her, her retina is, is seared in the shape of the eclipse, and she's, for, her, for the rest of her life, she's looking at eclipses. <laughs> so have fun today. Wear your little thingies. Look, oh, and something else to do, find a shadow, specifically of a tree. I was out on the field um, work, when I worked for the state of Georgia. We're out doing some stream sample. I'm sat down for lunch. And I'm just sitting under this tree and I looked on the ground. I was like, what on earth is... We're in the middle of a partial eclipse and I didn't know it. And as the light filters through a tree, every time it gets to a, a V or a little hole, it makes a pinhole camera. And it projects hundreds of little eclipses on the ground. There's somewhere out there. It's not springtime. Oh, there's a tree right there. Go out and look under a tree. You will be amazed. But also, I used my Starry app app yesterday, and I took this, this photo of it. I said I was inside, and I pointed at where the sun should be, and I saved a screenshot. Look for Jupiter to the top left, Mercury next to the sun, Venus to the right bottom of the sun. Then, the, well, the moon will be across the sun by this point, just two days ago, and then Saturn and Mars. That is amazing. Now, somewhere up there, there's a comet. 
and I forgot to look up the place of the comet beforehand. There's a comet up there too, and I'm going to look it up beforehand. Hopefully you can see it too. But just remember, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, Mars, five of the visible planets. That is shocking. And I didn't even have time to talk about how we use gravity theory after we discovered Uranus. Uranus had gone less than three quarters of a way around its orbit in 80 years. We realized the orbit is wrong, and they worked out mathematically and they said, hey, there's another planet. And someone, one of the astronomers wrote a letter to the Berlin Observatory, and they pointed their telescope to where that guy said their planet should be, and they discovered Neptune that night. They used an invisible planet's orbit to find another invisible planet using gravity theory. That is one of the greatest triumphs of, of, of experimental physics in world history. It's amazing. So have fun out there. And I'm going to leave you with this as we answer some questions.